Today I'm going to talk about inverting visitor-based control flow and my name is Daniel and I work for Mapbox on graphs and on graph partitioners and routing engines and I will give you a short introduction into Boost Graph um, as a use case for how to invert visitors to iterators. Um, just a quick disclaimer here, so the slides are there will be code on slides, but it's not compilable. It's just for presenting the code. Um, the actual code that you can compile and run is on GitHub here, and you can follow along or just take a look at home. Yeah, and I brought Nat with me. Oh. I'm Nat Goodspeed, and um, my interest is in the coroutine part of the control inversion. Um, Daniel proposed this idea, which I thought was fascinating, and uh, he and I have been working together on bringing it to fruition. So, here we go. Thanks. Okay, so, um, this is for example what our graph partitioner gives us after a run. So you can see a visualized graph, and this is actually boost graph, and this is just a example of what you can do with boost graph. And so to give you a, a quick introduction to Boost Graph, what Boost Graph is, what it does, and what it provides, it's a generic library and has certain building blocks. So for example, um, it comes with data structures for graph representation. That is um, how you represent your vertices, your edges in your graph. Um, it also provides you with ways to iterate over edges, over vertices, um, over adjacent vertices, for example. Um, and then you have properties. So for example, you can attach properties to your edges. This could be um, like a distance, like a street distance in the road network example. Um, and if you have a way to represent the graph and to iterate over your edges and vertices, you, you also want to run, for example, a DAX search or um, a graph walk. So breadth first search or depth first search. And a major way to customize these algorithms is using visitors. So you have to provide a visitor and then you can customize what happens, for example, on every vertex your Dijkstra search discovers. And because it's a generic library, it comes with concepts. So there's, for example, a concept for incident graphs. So this means you have features on this graph to uh, extract the source and the target for edges um, and you can get for example the out edges and then you have the bidirectional graph and it refines this graph concept and you have then a way to also get the in edges so the incoming edges for vertex um, and you have those concepts and when you have those concepts you also have certain models that um, that implement these concepts. For example, the most popular ones are the adjacency list here, um, the adjacency matrix, and the compressed sparse row graph. And these are implementations that store your vertices and your edges and model the concepts. And these graph representations, they, they decide, for example, if your graph is a directed graph, an undirected graph, um, and what kind of properties are, for example, on the, on the vertices and on the edges. Mm. So to take a look at adjacency lists, this is a adjacency list using a vector selector for your outer container, so for the container that stores your source vertices, and then you have the list selector here in the template for selecting the list container as your inner container here. And you also say it's a directed graph. And the question here is why does it make or why could it make sense to uh, to say I want a vector or, or I want a list? So what could be the reason for this generosity? Yeah? Maybe if you're manipulating the graph a lot, the list would be a more performant data structure than vector? Exactly, so it depends on the use case. For example, you can use vectors 
to be uh, um, contiguous. You can use list to uh, um, to get the iterator invalidation guarantees of list. For example, if you want to remove or add edges, and this really depends on your use case and how you use the graph. So you can customize and you can also provide your own selectors with your own storage backend, basically. Okay, and this is how you use it. In this case, we're using a vector as an outer container and also as an inner container. Um, we don't care about iterator invalidation. Um, so okay, let's just instantiate the graph here, add some edges to it, and that's it. And then you can use the graph. So now, of course, we want to add some data, some metadata to our graph. For example, in this case, we want to add a duration to every edge. And the way we can do it is we just specify our edge data struct in the template parameter here um, as edge data. And for, for our vertex data, we just use no property because we don't need vertex data. And what we then can do is we just instantiate our graph here, we add some edges, and we also add the edge data to it. Mm. And the interesting part then is how we can use this graph and for accessing properties, bundle properties here, we just provide a lambda that, that uses the subscript operator here to extract the duration from each edge. And we can add a, we can provide a predicate here that checks if a duration is greater than zero. And then what we can do is we, we extract all the edges from the graph. We pipe it through transform. So this is basically a map operation. And then we filter the positive durations. And then we reduce it using accumulate mm, to reduce it to a single duration. Start the piping there. Is that one yeah. of your pseudo code doesn't compile? Or no, does that really work? That's boost range. That's boost range, and it's actually yeah. mm, a really cool way to use boost range, and um, because edges returns a pair of first and and um, second, and these are iterators, so you'd have to manually iterate over the over the pair, which is kind of ugly in all the examples. Do it like this, but. Um, it's really nice to use boost range for these kinds of things. Okay, so the problem using adjacency list is it really doesn't scale. If you have, for example, the road network for for North America, it just doesn't scale. You have containers of containers, and you have over allocation, and there's no way um, to use this. So the compressed sparse row graph here is a so-called static graph. So once this graph is constructed, you cannot modified, you cannot add edges or remove edges, for example. What you still can do is you can change edge properties or vertex properties. For example, you can change duration, distance, or whatever. Um, but the graph representation is fixed, and this works like this. You have two contiguous blocks of memory, so basically two vectors. Mm. And the first vector stores indices into the second vector, into the out edges. And by using a sentinel here, we can, we can do this indirection here and get a range of first and last. And this is, this is um, the open, close to the including, excluding range that you know from standard library, for example. And this way you can access all your out edges. In this example, you have only one out edge at each vertex. Yeah. Okay, so in the code it looks like this. Now we have to uh, provide our sources and targets, so basically our edges up front. So we're not, we're not able to uh, instantiate the graph and then add edges. Um, instead, we have to provide it like this in a compact fashion. So we have edges from 0 to 1, then from 1 to 2, and from 2 to 0. And by using this tag here, we select the appropriate constructor. Um, so we basically tell the Boost Graph Library to, uh, to modify our vectors. And what it does is it sorts the vectors by the edges, by um, first by the source and then by the target. So we 
tell the constructor here, feel free to modify our vertices and to, to use this storage in place. Yeah? So is this construct in place from sources and targets? That's not like real C++, right? That's just like a placeholder? Um, this is a tag in the boost graph library. It's like boost and then... It's a value. Yeah. It's okay. a named value. So the idea is you have like 10 constructors. For example, there is a tag for um, construct, um, construct and your edges are already sorted. Um, and depending on if your edges are sorted or not, you just select the tag that you want to use. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so now that we have a way to represent our graph and have a way to, uh, to walk our, over our graph, to walk over edges and vertices, we want to uh, do, for example, more advanced graph walks, for example, breadth first search or depth first search, or we want to, uh, to do like shortest path queries. And the Boost Graph Library provides a range of these algorithms, and the, the key part here is customization works by providing visitors. For example, you invoke your breath first search and you provide a visitor and this visitor um, has a function that triggers on every vertex the breath first search encounters. And this way you can customize these algorithms. And in the code it looks like this. So we provide a visitor here. We implement our discover vertex function and what it does is just prints out the vertex. And then, when we run this function, when we run the breath first search function, we provide our visitor, and what happens next is the visitor just calls our function um, with every vertex it discovers. So this prints out all the vertices in breath first order. Yeah? So why is discover visitor wrapped in a visitor call? Oh, um, so the boost graph library uses some fancy techniques to uh, to to select to um, allow you to s to set visitors or property maps. So what you have to do is you have to wrap your visitor in a visitor call, and then you can say dot property map or dot, and provide basically um, it's different a kind of, of named parameters. Yeah, there are so many parameters to a typical boost graph algorithm that they provided this wrapper mechanism for saying this is the parameter I would like to specify. And is it implicitly there's no implicit conversion of visitor for it's it's like a hack um to uh, allow you to provide for example visitors if you want to provide one but if not it's just using a default. Yeah. Okay. So the use case that we had uh, that came up was um, we wanted to uh, to write a baseline router that we could compare our routing prototype against routing engine prototype against. And what you usually do is you uh, you start a Dijkstra search at your starting node, your starting vertex. You start a Dijkstra search at your target vertex on a reverse graph, and then you step them step by step, and if those two vertices, if those two searches meet in the middle, you found a path and you can reconstruct it. And of course we assume here that there exists a path. Um, and this was the use case that came up, and the problem here is how can we actually, how can we start our Dijkstra search from the front and then stop it and then start our Dijkstra search from the end, stop it, and then ping pong between those two visitors. Because if you run this Dijkstra shortest path, what it does is it runs from start to the end. And um, what we really want to do is we want to stop the, the function call from within the visitor and then resume it. So one way to do it is to use threads and synchronization to to um, emulate this behavior, this concurrency, and if you if you're in the middle, you basically have to throw an exception from your visitor to get out of the visitor and catch it on the call side, which is kind of ugly because 
now we're mixing concurrency and parallelism and we we don't need the synchronization here we don't need the overhead of context switching um, and the idea is to use cooperative multitasking so basically coroutines so this, this use case streams for coroutines mm. and the idea with coroutines is that we we start a coroutine with a search from the from the source we start a coroutine with a search from the end and then we we basically ping pong between those two searches and if they meet in the middle we're done so this is the basic idea how it works um, and what's cool about this is it works for the boost graph library but not only for boost graph but for all visitors so it's not specific to boost graph and what it looks like is this so now we introduce coroutines here and this is using the boost coroutine library and the idea is to provi still provide a visitor but in the visitor you just bind a reference to a coroutine push type so this push type is a coroutine that has a function call operator and you can just push vertices into the coroutine so you're sending vertices to the coroutine and this is all your visitor has to do so you, you provide a visitor it binds a coroutine you implement the function here and you just push a single vertex into the coroutine to the outside and then what the call side does is the call side uses the coroutine pull type to implement a generator so you, you might know it from python generators um, and then you provide a lambda and the lambda takes a sync coroutine you start your Dijkstra search and you push your um, your sync to your visitor and here at this point the coroutine basically does nothing it's still stopped in a stopped state so the function doesn't really run at this point um, but what we can do is now we can loop or we can step over the generator so we do it we provide two generators one generator for the forward search one generator for the backward search and as long as there are values in there so basically there's an, impl an implicit conversion to pool here so as long as we can loop over the generators here we can use the generators.get function to extract a single vertex that we push into the coroutine in the visitor and we can use the function call operator here to step the coroutine by one vertex so using the function call operator here you step it by one and using dot get you extract the vertex and in your in your visitor you push a single vertex into the sink here and this technique allows you to stop coroutines and to resume them from the outside and it decouples the logic so basically it decouples what you're doing here um, in the loop from your visitor all your visitor does is it generates a lazy range of the Dijkstra search space which is kind of cool because now we not only can can stop and resume our generator we can also use the standard library to iterate over the generator so instead of implementing standard library algorithms in our visitor we can just use find if here to uh, use the standard library on the generators so we can use find if we can use standard equal mismatch and so on so your visitor only provides mm, basically the Dijkstra search space in order um, and you can do this the same the same way for uh, the breathword search for example so your visitor for a breathword search only generates the order and then the call side can use the standard library to do for example the find if and in this case we are we're using a lambda here and this lambda just checks if there's a point of interest on this particular vertex and then we loop over this lazy range of the Dijkstra search space and stop if we found a point of interest so in this decouples generating a search space from the actual algorithm you want to run on it okay so this technique works not only on boost but boost is a a somewhat cool use case for it and if you want to give it a try um, the examples are on github
And what I recommend you doing is just grab some, some OpenStreetMap data because it's freely available, um, construct your graph, add some properties, for example, the street distance, um, then add an R tree for geospatial lookups, and you can route on the graph. And what you get from it is something like this. So this is a visualization of an open street map based graph using Boost Graph Library, and you can then route on this. Okay, so our takeaways are this. Um, using Boost Graph, and especially Boost Graph with Boost Range, is a really cool and really powerful technique. And the examples and documentation of Boost Graph is missing out on Boost Range and C11, in my opinion, because it makes a lot of those um, examples easier to understand, easier to read. Um, if you add Boost Geometry into this mix, it's really powerful for graph practitioners for routing. Mm, there, are some, there are some tricks in here to optimize the storage space. For example, if you want a graph of North America, you have to optimize your vertex and edge index types, because otherwise it's just too huge for, for a single machine. Um, there exists a parallel boost graph library, but um, I actually haven't had a look at it because when you can just spin up an AWS EC2 instance for a few hours and it gives you 250 gigabytes of RAM, that's good enough <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. Um, and the main takeaway is using Boost Graph and Boost Coroutines is um, a really powerful technique to, to transform a visitor-based approach that couples your logic in the visitor to an iterator-based approach that allows you to use the standard library um, and allows you to resume and stop visitors, to, to step visitors one by one. And it's not specific to Boost Graph, but basically to, uh, to all applications or to every use case that has a visitor-based approach. Yeah. And now Ned is going to show you how to implement a generic event visitor and also a bit gory details about coroutines. <laughs> yeah, um, so in case some of that went by a little fast, I'm going to go into a lot more detail. So wake up. I know it's that time after lunch. So what you saw was um, a Dexter search example that looked like this the, for the visitor, with um, where Daniel hand coded the struct and overrode the examined vertex method. It's short and sweet and to the point. It binds a reference to the relevant <laughs> push type coroutine and then overrides the examined vertex method to pass that vertex to the coroutine. It's used like this. You instantiate the visitor with whatever constructor parameters it requires, in this case, the sync, and then you pass it to Dijkstra's short, shortest paths as the named visitor parameter. Unfortunately, you must write a different visitor for each different event you want to intercept. Or must you? For each algorithm, Boost Graph supports a generic way to make a visitor that intercepts a specified visitor event. Events are specified by selecting one of a set of predefined tag types. So for instance, onExamined vertex corresponds to the examined vertex method. Then instead of overriding that specific method, your visitor provides an apply operator with correct signature. You use it by passing it to boost make Dijkstra visitor. Make Dijkstra visitor examines the embedded event filter type def to dispatch the visitor on the correct event. So why is this an advantage? So far we've done more typing. The difference is that you can provide the dispatch tag as a template parameter. So now you can parameterize the visitor template to intercept any event accepting a vertex. 
or you can use the idiom found in Boostgraph itself for its bundled event visitor structs, a helper function. In this case, make dextra stepwise. With the helper function, you pass a trivial instance of the tag event struct for the helper function to deduce its type. With that as background, how about a generic Coro event visitor? Start with Coro event visitor base. We want it to be generic for any event type, either vertex or edge. In fact, this allows us to use it with any graph type. We just need to know the type of the coroutine that will receive the vertex or edge. This coroutine should pass whatever data type the selected visitor method receives. Notice that Coro event visitor base only publishes the event filter type def and binds the coroutine reference. It doesn't yet provide the apply operator. We'll get there. Now for the Coro event visitor subclass. The constructor only forwards the coroutine reference of whatever type to Coro event visitor base. The apply operator receives the edge or vertex implied by the tag event selector and passes it through to the coroutine bound by Coro event visitor base. For completeness, we provide a make Coro visitor helper function. It accepts the push type coroutine and trivial tag instance and returns an appropriate Coro event visitor instance. But what's this boost coroutines push coroutine parameter? Unfortunately, when that parameter is specified as boost coroutines asymmetric coroutine edge or vertex colon colon push type, the compiler cannot infer the vertex t from the past coroutine parameter. We'd have to specify it explicitly, as you see below. But it turns out that in the boost coroutine API, asymmetric coroutine of t push type is just a type def for push coroutine of t. And when you specify the make coro visitor parameter as the push coroutine template instead of a dependent type in asymmetric coroutine, the compiler can infer the template parameter. So in the Dijkstra shortest paths example program, instead of writing out the Dijkstra stepwise at all, you only need to call make coro visitor specifying the push type coroutine and the visitor event tag. This works for any graph type and any boost graph algorithm with its own visitor factory function. Yes? Um, this is probably a dumb question, but what are we trying to get to here? So this is simplifying the use case. Instead of having to hand write a struct for each visitor, these visitors don't have business logic in them. These visitors are only passing the vertex data through to a consumer. So the coroutine thing? Yes. Okay, and so this is just making it... Uh, this is just making it so generic. In a more generic way. Right, so you can say, I'm going to use a coroutine for this visitor. I don't need to write that visitor at all. I can use this helper function to just do the visitor for me, and all my business logic lives in the driving loop that pulls from the coroutine. So if I understand correctly, then the... Um, the business logic doesn't need to know that there are coroutines involved at all. Actually, it does, and we'll, I'll show you that in a few. So we can use this for any visitor event type. We need only make the coroutines past data type agree with the type of the parameter passed to the indicated visitor event method, edge or vertex. But what if you want access to the past graph T reference as well? A boost coroutine asymmetric coroutine can only pass a single data value. But this is C++. We have ways. We can define a coroutine that passes a standard tuple of vertex T and const reference to graph T. We can specialize Coro event visitor for this value type. As with the simpler Coro event visitor presented earlier, the constructor only passes the coroutine reference to the base class. The apply operator constructs and passes the relevant tuple through the coroutine. This is why we need a different specialization. The simpler Coro event visitor only passed its edge or vertex parameter. This one makes a tuple with both parameters and passes it through the coroutine.
So, so coroutines only take one parameter? Right. But if you need more values, you can use a tuple. The same make coro visitor helper function works for this specialization too. This one is selected when the type passed to the coroutine is deduced as standard tuple of two types. You might have been wondering about the fact that the tuple graph template parameter isn't const reference qualified. You specify the actual tuple type as const reference to your graph type. That's why the graph is passed by const reference, not by value. We use different template parameters for the graph type in the tuple and the graph type passed to the apply operator versus <coughs> so they need not literally be identical they only need to be convertible by the way how can we get away with passing a graph reference to another coroutine the answer is that graph reference is valid throughout the call to the apply operator. It will not be invalidated until the apply operator returns. Even though we're context switching away to another coroutine, to the apply operator, it looks and behaves exactly like a function call. Until main passes control back to the apply operator, it doesn't return and the graph reference remains valid. <laughs> But so far, we've described intercepting exactly one visitor event. What if, for a given algorithm, we want to intercept more than one event? First of all, how would you even specify that? At that point, wouldn't you need to write your own visitor class? Actually, no. The boost graph make visitor helper functions also accept a standard pair of event visitors, actually a chain of standard pairs. So a pair of which the first is a visitor, the second is another pair of visitors to arbitrary depth. At this point, I can't resist a brief detour. Obviously, this chain of standard pair design dates back to before we had variadic templates. We could make that nicer for the caller by introducing a variadic helper function. The degenerate case, the recursion tail, just returns the past event visitor. The general case calls make pair with the first event visitor and whatever is returned by a recursive call to build up the rest of the standard pairs. By the way, this is a really important use case for return type deduction. Notice the auto return type on each of these functions. David. Uh, just to be pedantic, there's a conflict between those first two there if you pass just a single event visitor. Believe it or not, this compiles and runs. It, it does compile and run because there are bugs in all the compilers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to standardize this bug for C17. OK. So I did notice that, but I thought it's actually clearer when it's written this way. I and so I left it this way for the presentation. Um, so finally, we can make a wrap, we can wrap a make Deitsch visitor <coughs> with a variadic version that builds the chain of standard pairs to pass into the real function. And that lets us write a make Dijkstra visitor call without manually constructing the chain of standard pairs. Back to intercepting multiple visitor events. The obvious problem is when the main function retrieves a vertex from the coroutine, how does it know which visitor event sent it? In the visitor, you have no problem. You know which, vis which method you're in. When you're passing them all through this channel, this coroutine back to the main function, you have to differentiate them. How do we distinguish them? We'd like to pass the tag, for instance, on examined vertex, but as a type. So for simplicity, we'll pass a standard type index to distinguish the various types of visitor events. So we specialize Coro event visitor again, this time adding a third member to the standard tuple. The implementation is almost identical to the specialization for edge or vertex and graph save that we construct the tuple with the type index for the tag type. 
Again, the same make coro visitors helper function works with this specialization too. You select it by appropriate choice of the coroutine data type. Why does this work? The point is that each coroutine has its own call stack. And this is how the visitor at arbitrary depth within the opaque Dijkstra shortest pass implementation within the boost graph library can magically pass control back to the code that wants to examine each vertex. We neither know nor care how deep the call stack is within the boost graph library. So, <laughs> main. Unplug my microphone. Still arrive? Okay. So, main calls some func, which launches a coroutine, which runs Dijkstra shortest paths. After some amount of time, Dijkstra shortest paths calls the visitor. Its examined vertex method context switches back to some func still running on the original stack. When it's done, if it chooses, it resumes the coroutine, which returns to Dijkstra's shortest paths until it hits another vertex, calls examined vertex again, and so forth. What's cool about this is that it's completely up to this logic whether it even bothers to resume the coroutine. And so you see how it scales for the bidirectional search. You launch two different coroutines. Each has its own stack. That's how you can ping pong back and forth between them. Again, it's completely up to this driving logic, which one gets resumed and when. The coroutine library presents both symmetric and asymmetric coroutines. The names may seem a bit puzzling. Symmetric coroutines are so-called because a coroutine must explicitly designate its successor. Each coroutine context switches away in, to every other in exactly the same way. The API doesn't recognize any special relationships between any two coroutines. This is very powerful and a bit obnoxious. You would probably use symmetric coroutines to implement a higher level library rather than using them directly in your application. By contrast, an asymmetric coroutine has a special re relationship with its caller. It's similar to the relationship between an ordinary function and its caller. The caller specifies the called function, but the called function returns anonymously to whoever called it. An asymmetric coroutine context switches back to its invoker. The twist is that then the invoker can resume the asymmetric coroutine at exactly the point where it left off last time. Boost asymmetric coroutines favor unidirectional data flow. When you instantiate a push type coroutine, the library implicitly instantiates a corresponding pull type coroutine and passes a non-const reference into the push type coroutine function body. This is how the coroutine body refers to its invoker. From the pull type reference, the push type coroutine can retrieve values sent by the invoker. The same thing happens in reverse when you explicitly instantiate a pull type coroutine. The library synthesizes and passes a reference to a corresponding push type coroutine. Again, that's how the coroutine body refers to its invoker. Ironically, the relationship between push type and pull type coroutines is pretty symmetrical. As you've already observed in earlier slides, when the body of a pull type coroutine wants to send a value to its invoker, it only needs to call the apply operator on the past push type coroutine. At the invoker's end, there's a protocol for obtaining values from a pull type coroutine. You must test whether there's another value available. A pull type coroutine might produce any number of values. That number might be zero. If there is a value available, you retrieve it with the get method. But then, of course, if you expect the coroutine to produce another value, at some point you must pass control back to it. 
test, retrieve, advance. Does that protocol sound familiar? As Daniel mentioned earlier, pull type coroutines also support the iterator protocol, providing input iterators. This allows you to use standard begin or standard end, which implies that you can use a range 4 or any of the standard library algorithms to iterate over the values provided by a pull type coroutine. So, zooming out, I'd like to leave you with this takeaway. And that's why when I saw your presentation earlier talking about the visitors with which you engage the libtooling library, I thought, aha, this might possibly be interesting for you. The Coro Event Visitor example code can be found at the gist GitHub com URL above. Again, it does run. Uh, David was first. Um, so what you've done is you've converted a visitor type library into like an iterator style library. Yes. And the cost is that you have this extra stack space put somewhere yes. that you don't really need. Because if the original library was an iterator based in the first place, then that would actually be more efficient overall. Is that right? Yeah. That's not. <laughs> so so who's craft? So, but it's not, right? So this applies particularly to libraries that you can't crack open and fix exactly, yeah. that are visitor based. Yep. yep. But even, so, <laughs> I guess I should be restating all of that. Um, David was remarking that um, this applies particularly when you cannot crack open the library of interest and recast it um, to be a pull uh, source in the first place which is true, um, even in the open source context, it is possible to rewrite the Boost Graph Library algorithms so that they do not need uh, to be adapted this way. Um, and there was some Boost mailing list traffic about people who started down that path and got discouraged. Even with an open source library, you may prefer to use what's there and adapt it. It might not be that the cost of an extra stack is the limiting factor on your resources. You were next, I think. Uh, did you compare it, uh, performance uh, with our other approaches, like maybe stackless coroutine with the context you need to store it in the stack? OK. So the question was, did we compare this approach's performance um, between this and um, some other approach, such as stackless coroutines? Um, and that's sort of two questions wrapped up in one. Um, for the performance part, there was um, a gentleman on the Boost mailing list, and I don't quite remember his name at this moment. He was in the same thread as our original discussions of this, who did do some performance comparisons, and um, he reported that he was satisfied with the performance. Um, I haven't been concerned with graphs nearly as large as what Daniel has been working with, and so I have not been involved in the performance testing myself. The other part of your question has to do with, could I do the same thing with stackless coroutines? And the answer is no. Um, why is that? Because you don't know and you don't have to care how deep the call stack is within the opaque Boost Graph library. If you were using stackless coroutines, every one of those functions in the call chain would have to know about the possibility of resuming. You would have to alter the source to each of those functions in the library in the library that you may not want to rewrite. Um, it's stackful coroutines that give you the ability to do this transparently. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Okay. And Jens? Um, so how much do you gain in kind of uh, maintainability? Um, how, how more is your code maintainable? 
in the sense of doing it traditionally. Is it a better way to, to write that also faster or is it, is it better maintainable in the future? I claim that this makes a lot more sense to me. I believe Daniel would say the same. But consider the ping pong Dijkstra search example. It's really hard to coordinate that when you're using visitors. You need to be able to start and stop two different searches from within the visitor. Yeah, so um, in the stepwise ping pong example, you need a way to, uh, to jump out of the visitors and then to resume them. Because if you throw an exception, you are out of the visitor and out of the algorithm. And you would have to start again, which doesn't make sense because then you would start your text research at the start again. Um, so in this case, it's really needed. This, this is the official way to do it. Yes. Um, so in this use case, it's really needed. Um, in a use case where you don't have the stepwise searches, it still makes sense because you only write one visitor that is a couple of lines, um, and then this visitor provides you the search space, for example, the search space for a breath for search, and the visitor is decoupled from the actual business logic. So the visitor only provides you the search space for a breath for search, and the call site does, for example, the point of interest search on your breath for search order. So you decouple the logic and you don't have to implement um, the point of interest, the point of interest search, for example, inside the visitors, because it doesn't really make sense. You, you can't use um, the standard library algorithms, for example, inside the visitor, because you only have one single vertex. So what you have to do is you have to, for example, store a vector of vertices that you already visited to store the breath first search order inside the visitor. And um, this is getting really ugly and you have to keep track of the vertices manually. Um, so writing a visitor once that only constructs the search space and then writing the business logic on the call side is just beautiful. And you can use standard equal mismatch and so on. Find if. Yeah. David again. Um, so how does boost coroutines compare to the current like standardization proposal for coroutines? Okay, the question was, how does boost coroutine compare to the current standardization proposal for coroutines? And I believe, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but I believe... Peter. Peter. I believe Peter already asked that question when he asked, um, could we compare this approach to using stackless coroutines? That's the answer. The current standardization proposal is based on stackless coroutines. So are you familiar at all with Python generators? Yeah. Okay. So a Python generator is a pretty good example of a, co a stackless coroutine. All of the state that is um, required to suspend and resume is stored with the, um, the generator iterator um, that is produced when you invoke a Python generator function. And it, um, you know, you re yield from it and resume into it. And the problem is that when you have a call chain of these things, each level must yield in a loop over the next level down. You can't just yield from the bottommost one and then reconstruct the call chain. Each time you're touching every level in and out, and every one of them has to know that the one below it is going to be suspending and resuming. The problem with stackless coroutines is that since the control comes up, it uses the same path as a return. And so the caller has to know the distinction between I've got a value or I'm done. The caller has to make the distinction. If the caller might itself suspend, it has to propagate that distinction up to its caller. It involves pervasively marking up your your whole call chain. Well, like in this case right here, it seems like you're drawing Dijkstra's algorithms concurrently. You could create your two stackless coroutines and then just pull one from one and then pull one from the other and just keep doing it that way. And that seems like that would work. So um, when we create a stackful coroutine, 
we have a call stack on which all of the functions of the Dijkstra search algorithm can execute. When you say a stackless coroutine, you are talking about a single function invocation. Mm -hmm. So a, you could rewrite the top level Dijkstra um, shortest paths function as a stackless function, a resumable function in Microsoft terminology. And then it would call some internal function that does the next level of searching. It too would have to be written as a resumable function. It will call something else, possibly recursively. That too must be a resumable function. So what you're saying, just to make sure I understand correctly, is that if, you, if you're using a stackless style, you're going to have to modify the underlying library by making all these things annotated with stackless. Yes. Couldn't you pass just pass handler that uh, use stackless coroutines inside, so the library itself doesn't know about it? So the question was, couldn't you pass a visitor that um, uses stackless uses a stackless resumable function so that the library doesn't need to know about it? Um, Gore Nishinov, um wrote a somewhat convoluted example in which. Um, he showed doing something like that. The problem was that you have to rewrite one side or the other. And um, I encourage you to work this out for yourself. Um, <laughs> there have, one of the um, discussions that has gone on actually several different times in WG21 is why can't we take stackful coroutines and unify them with stackless coroutines in some way? And when you approach it from the 10,000 foot level, that seems eminently desirable. It's when you start diving into what does that mean? How does it work? That you begin to appreciate the difficulties. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm But there's an impedance mismatch because um, a, stackless a stackless function returns up and out. It suspends by returning, in effect. A stackful, a function running on a stackful coroutine suspends by calling. It suspends down. And it can be completely oblivious of the fact that somebody below it at some level might switch away, might context switch away to a different stack. There's a whole different semantic in the two approaches. Have I addressed that or just silenced you? I'm closer. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, further questions? Yes, I didn't get your name. Uh, Martin. Martin, hi. When you switch from uh, one coroutine to another, uh, presumably it, it has to uh, change the stack pointer and save a lot of registers and so on. How, how much overhead is there in switching and calling and resuming? So Martin's question is, what's the overhead in context switching from one coroutine to another? It's a fair question. But you've just identified the key elements. Um, you switch the stack pointer and save and restore some registers. Um, and one of the fun things about coroutines is that context switching coroutines is vastly more efficient than context switching threads. There's no kernel entry and the amount of data that you have to save and restore is way smaller. And it's just on the stack, right? It's not like you have to store it to main memory or something. That's right. I mean, what you're doing is you're saving the relevant registers on this stack changing the stack pointer, and then reloading the relevant registers from that stack. That's what I'm trying to understand. How many registers are we talking about? There's quite a few on the, on the six that you have to save. It's the ones defined by the ABI as the ones that will be preserved across a function call. And um, I don't know the literal answer to your question because I didn't implement the coroutine library. I'm an enthusiastic user. <laughs> But I'm not the implementer. On the uh, documentation, there is a performance page which has some information 
information on that. Yes, thank you. I should have mentioned that myself. Um, I'm glad you pointed out the coroutine documentation does have a performance page that talks about that. Further questions? Well, I see that it's already 20 of 8, so thank you all very much. <laughs>